uh, some small gifts from the fellowship, uh, some good teaching materials. Uh, if you have not signed up, sign up today. It's $10 for the lunch and the materials. And, um, and you can take your picture with Jacob. Are we advertising that? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was a dunk tank. That was yeah. a dunk tank. Oh, a dunk tank. Well, we oh. didn't get that one on time. So <laughs> I'll pay 20 for that. Some guy um, took a picture of me last week. He ripped it off the wall in the post office. <laughs> <laughs> well, we started with the dangerous doctrines. Now, where does it lead to? Where does it, it's the return of Jesus. Uh, the world will go crazy and crazier until Jesus comes. But we have one for sure thing. He is coming back uh, to set up God's kingdom. And uh, it's not like what the NAR is saying, that we have to set up the kingdom here. The Bible says, when the Ancient of Days come, then he'll set up the kingdom. It's when Jesus comes. Uh, now, that's clear in Scripture. And um, we know uh, that Jesus said that my kingdom is not of this world. But when Jesus came, it wasn't in a vacuum. He actually had all these history, the history of the Old Testament, even the history between the two testaments, the intertestamental period. There's a lot of history behind that. And um, one, one of the things we find out is that as, as the church grows and we understand the, the Jewish roots of it, uh, we can appreciate more the New Testament and its background and its uh, understanding of why and when Jesus came. So tonight, the kickoff of Hanukkah, Christmas, and the return of Jesus. Please help me welcome Jacob Prash. Good evening, dear friends. Good evening. Good evening. Seasons blessings. Let's begin with the Christmas carol. We should sing a Christmas carol. We'll sing it in Latin. Ades te fideles, leti triumphante, venite, venite, and Bethlehem. Natum fidete, regem angelorum, venite adoremus, venite adoremus, venite adoremus, dominum. Nombre Patre, cum Filio, cum Spiritus Santo. That's what I always loved about Monsignor McClarity. As long as you had the cash, he had the absolution. The only good thing about the Catholic education my Irish mother rammed down my throat was they taught me Latin so I can refute their propaganda. <laughs> All right, that's enough clowning around. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for your mercy, for your kindness, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord God, for the blood of your Son that cleanses from all sin. And these things we study tonight and on Saturday and throughout this weekend, Lord God. Let these things not increase our knowledge with the mere aim of increasing our knowledge, but increasing our knowledge with the aim of preparing the way for the return of your Son, of glorifying your name, of reaching the lost, of building up your Son's body, and edifying your people in these last days. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, amen. It is to be noted that every major messianic prophecy about the nativity, about the return of Jesus, every major prophecy given in the Old Testament about his birth speaks of both his first and his second coming in the context. They speak of his first and second coming in the context. That's true of Micah, who says he'll be born in Bethlehem. It's true of Isaiah 7.14, says he'll be born of a virgin. When you read the broad context, there is reference to both his first and his second coming, there is prophetic intent for both his first and his second coming. The Christmas story, as it's called, if you want to call it that, it's a wonderful story for little children in Sunday school. Unfortunately, we have people who've been saved 
50 years, 70 years, and more. And that's all they know is the Christmas story. When they study the nativity, it's the same old, same old that they've been hearing since they were little children. In Sunday school, when we study the second coming, we are not simply studying what did happen. We are studying what is going to happen. His first coming teaches about his second. His first coming is a type of his second. Unless we understand his first coming, we will not be ready for his second. The nativity is future prophetic history. As we've often said, the key to understanding prophecy is understanding history. If we don't understand what did happen, we are never going to understand what is going to happen. It's not just about the past. It's about the future. Let's begin with the Gabriel factor, the factor of Gabriel. Gabriel, the mighty one of God, or the mighty man of God, it could be translated, the mighty one of God. And how he comes into play in both the first coming and the second. Let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse 19. We'll begin, please, in verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. The Old Testament has a series of supernatural pregnancies. Usually, they are post-menopausal conceptions. This goes back to Sarah. It comes into play in the story of Rachel and Leah. It is true of the mother of the prophet Samuel. It is also true of the mother of Samson and so forth. But it continues into the New Testament with the parents of Yochanan Hamatbil, John the Baptist. All of these supernatural conceptions foreshadow the fact that the Messiah would be supernaturally conceived by divine intervention. They foreshadow the fact that the Messiah would be conceived by divine intervention. All of Israel's prophets and the great heroes of faith in the Old Testament, all of them foreshadow Christ in some way. But when you see people, someone who was supernaturally conceived there's going to be something very acute in their life, their biography, their history, that is going to be an unambiguously clear picture of Christ. It begins with Isaac. Take your son, take your only son. God doesn't recognize Ishmael, anything done in the flesh. Okay, take your only son and sacrifice him. And then by figure, we're told in the New Testament, he gets him back in resurrection. Okay. Take your only son, Isaac. Okay. When Samson dies, he dies like this. Okay. You'll always find there is something conspicuously foreshadowing Christ when you see someone supernaturally conceived. Now, that's not to say there are not other shadows of Christ. There certainly are. But when you see the ones who are supernaturally conceived, it's more conspicuous. More conspicuous, usually something about his death and resurrection. John the Baptist 
was the greatest man who ever lived other than Jesus. Yet he who was least in the kingdom is greater than John. Some people have foolishly said, I'm serious, that John the Baptist didn't go to heaven. That's not what that meant. John the Baptist represented the epitome of righteousness under the law. By religious observance and dedication, you could not achieve a higher degree of righteousness than John. He who was least in the kingdom, that is people who are born again, the reason their righteousness exceeds that of John is because it is an imputed righteousness. We have the righteousness of Christ, which is superior to John's. John is the highest that a human could possibly achieve. None born among women is greater than John. He's filled with the spirit from his mother's womb, and he teaches much about Elijah to come. He had the spirit of Elijah. But his birth is announced by Gabriel. Somehow, Elijah teaches in the Old Testament and Elisha and John the Baptist about the return of Elijah that will take place according to the book of Malachi. We'll look at that in a moment. You'll have joy and gladness. Many will rejoice in verse 14 at his birth. He'll be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink no wine or liquor and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. In other words, he'd be a Nazarite. He'd have a Nazarite vow. We have a teaching explaining the vow of the Nazarite and its typology. He will turn back many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. The idea of turn back, teshuvah, repent, repent. The underlying Hebrew thought under the Greek is teshuvah. And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the heart of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of righteousness so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. One of the things that happens before Jesus returns is a supernatural attack on the Christian family, dividing children from parents and parents from children. Even in the best of Christian families, we've seen an increase in the last 30 to 40 years of backslidden children. The amount of pastors who have backslidden children is almost unbelievable. There is an attack on the family and on institutions of marriage generally, of course, and these things are increasing in intensity but something happens in the relationship between parents and children in the last days. Remember Jesus said, children will be hated by parents, parents will hate against children. Something like this is going to happen. We have to remember that in the things that foreshadow the rapture, such as the rescue of Lot and his family, or the rescue of Noah and his family, the two things the New Testament uses the most to illustrate what the rapture will be like, in both instances, the Lord was not only interested in saving individuals, he was interested in saving families. The rapture will be the same. The Lord will be interested in saving families. But families and families of believers are under increasing attack. There is going to be some kind of credibility gap between the generations. Now, even sociologists have identified this since the 1960s. Even secular sociologists have identified this generation gap, this credibility gap. But it gets into the church. There will be, by divine grace, some kind of restoration that will take place by God's mercy. And that's not to say many will not fall away and betray one another. But it is to say that before the rapture, the Lord is going to try to restore families. And the ministry of Elijah will figure prominently in that divine intervention against this supernatural attack against the families. Now it goes beyond this, it has further meaning. I only mention it relative 
to the subject of the nativity. Let's continue. Zachariah said to the angel, how shall I know this for certain? I'm an old man, my wife's advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, Ani Gabriel, I am Gabriel. This would have harkened straight back to the book of Daniel. Let's continue with this a little bit further. Look with me, please, to the book of Judges, chapter 5. What we call the Song of Deborah. Again, our primary purpose is filming. Happy you could join us, but we're going to have to say things many of you are already familiar with because we're doing it for a film. But let's look. In the Song of Deborah, the Ballad of Deborah and Yael with the victory over Sisera. In verse 24, most blessed of women is Yael. Blessed is Yael among women. Pay attention. The Jezreel Valley, wrongly called the Valley of Armageddon. Armageddon comes from Har Megiddo, the Mount of Megiddo. Armageddon is not a, va is not a valley, it's a mountain overlooking the valley. The valley is called Jezreel. In modern Israel, it's called Emek Israel. It's the agricultural belt of northern Israel. It separates Samaria from Galilee. It geographically separates Samaria from Galilee. It's where the armies of Antichrist will assemble for his final last ditch assault to try to preempt the establishment of the millennial kingdom of Christ. There are four key mountains on each side of the periphery of Emek Israel, of the Valley of Jezreel. On the extreme eastern axis, okay, you have a mountain called Har Gilboa, Mount Gilboa, where Saul was killed and hung, okay. On the west, extreme west, separating it from the Mediterranean, you have Har Carmel, Mount Carmel, where Elijah confronted the priests of Baal. There are other mountains opposite Mount Gilboa almost is Har Moreh, where Gideon defeated the invaders. But at Nazareth, built on a cliff, it's almost like a land lagoon. There's a mountain in front of Nazareth, separating Nazareth from the Valley of Jezreel. This is called Har Tavor, Har Tavor, Mount Tabor. Okay. And a 180 degree line straight across from Mount Tabor is Har Megiddo, Mount Megiddo. <laughs> so just think, you draw a straight line from Nazareth through Mount Tabor to Megiddo, to Armageddon, straight line across. Okay. They are visible. You can see straight across the Jezreel Valley with the naked eye. Mount Tabor overshadows Nazareth. Napoleon ascended it. Look down at the Valley of Armageddon below, as people called it, although it's not the valley. And you understand, Har Megiddo, Har Megiddin. It's just, it's Mount Megiddo, the valley is Jezreel. And he looked down where the story of Deborah took place, and he said, this is, the first, this is the first place and the best place to mount my ultimate military campaign. That's what Napoleon said. A little Jewish girl named Miriam, she was probably 
no more than 15 or so at the time of the conception of Jesus. But she grew up in Nazareth in the shadow of Mount Tabor. And she would have known, everyone would have known, that's where it was, that's the mountain. Blessed are you among women. Blessed are you among women. Yael, blessed are you among women. As a little girl, she would have grown up literally within a stone's throw, almost spitting distance of Mount Tabor, the northern face of it facing just opposite Nazareth. Okay. If you take Mount Tabor out of the way, you can see the Valley of Jezreel and you can see Mount Megiddo, except Mount Tabor is there. Blessed are you among women. That's where it took place. Little did this little girl, Miriam, Mary, know that the angel Gabriel from the book of Daniel would tell her one day, blessed are you among women. You've got to understand the background. It must have been something of a mind-blowing experience. When I was a kid, I could see the Statue of Liberty from my roof. But I never went to the Statue of Liberty until I was approximately 40 or 42 years of age because my children were with me in New York and they wanted to go to the Statue of Liberty. They were visiting family, so I took them. When you come from a place, you don't really think about it. I used to live across the street from the United Nations and I would see people getting off buses with cameras from Japan and places like that, taking photographs of the UN. And I'm looking out the window, and I said, what on earth are those people looking at? You know, that's just the way it is. But I still knew what the UN was. I still know, knew what it was. I still knew what the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island were, even though I could cycle to it, just to the back of it. When I was a kid, I used to go there on my bicycle. Everybody knew it. Didn't think much about it, but everybody knew it. Miriam would have been the same. She would have known that's Mount Tabor. Now, ridiculously, the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church claim Mount Tabor is the Mount of the Transfiguration. It is not. The text of Matthew 16 makes it clear that that is Har Hermon, Mount Hermon, some distance away. Nonetheless, there's Mount Tabor, there's Miriam. So the same angel that takes the prophecy of Isaiah 7.14 and pronounces it to Mary, a virgin shall conceive. This becomes a problem for the rabbis. Two Hebrew words from Isaiah 7.14. Alma, Betula, Alma is the Hebrew word for a single young woman, as it were an eligible spinster, a single young woman. At that time, a single young woman was expected to be a virgin. Additionally, Isaiah 7.14 tells us it's a sign. There is nothing unusual about a young woman having a baby. Nothing unusual, it happens every day. The rabbis will try to say it is not a prophecy of the virgin birth, otherwise the word would have been betula, the Hebrew word for virgin. Their problem is that out of eight times that the word occurs in the Old Testament, Seven times, the ancient rabbis, the sages who translated the Septuagint, translated it Parthenos. You get the word Parthenogenesis. It was translated seven of eight times, including in Isaiah 7.14, as virgin, as virgin. And Alma, culturally, would have been expected to have been a virgin. So, we have the Gabriel factor. Gabriel has to do 
not only with the birth of Jesus, but the birth of John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah. The fact that John the Baptist embryonically recognized Jesus, embryonically, okay, that teaches about what's going to happen. Already, when Elijah comes back in some way, he is already going to know Jesus. They were together already. He's going to know him, okay? They're going to meet down here. Well, let's continue. Let us look how the Old Testament ends. The last thing it says, Malachi chapter 5. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. That's how the Old Testament ends. Hence, the New Testament opens with John the Baptist and the spirit of Elijah. An error that has been popularly taught by many people is that in the selection of Matthias to replace Judas Iscariot, they acted in the flesh by casting lots to find the replacement for Judas. In fact, it fulfilled an Old Testament prophecy. Their thinking was they should have waited for Paul to come along. This is completely wrong. When we read Acts chapter 1, they had to choose someone who'd been around, not from the time of Jesus, but from the time of John. John is transitional. He is the last figure of the Old Covenant and the first figure of the New. Remember, the law and prophets are preached until John, then grace and truth, okay? He is the last figure of the Old Covenant and the first figure of the New. He is the bridge between the two. There is one mistake in the Bible. I agree with every word in the Bible, but there is one mistake that we all need to be aware of. This is a mistake in your Bible. It is the blank page between the Old and New Testaments. That is a mistake. Jesus did not come from a theological or a spiritual or a historical or a cultural vacuum. The story of the birth of Jesus commences in Matthew chapter 1 with the genealogy of Jesus. Everybody understand? Now, let's look at Matthew chapter 0. Turn with me, please. Ruth chapter 4 is Matthew chapter 0. The genealogy of Jesus does not begin in Matthew 1 1. The genealogy of Jesus rather begins in chapter 4 of the book of Ruth. Verse 11. And the people who were in the court and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who's coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. 
and may you achieve wealth in Ephrata and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah through the offspring which the Lord gave you by this young woman, this Alma. <laughs> so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive. She gave birth to a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who's not left you without a redeemer today. May his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life, a sustainer of old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. And the neighbor women gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Oved. He's the father of Jesse, or Eshai, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hezron. To Hezron was born Ram. To Ram, Abinadab. To Abinadab was born Nashon. To Nashon, Salmon. To Salmon was born Boaz. To Boaz, Obed. And to Obed was born Jesse. And to Jesse, David. Now let's look at Matthew 1. That was Matthew 0, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and it gives his genealogy. This begins in Ruth chapter 4. A baby born in Bethlehem who's called the Redeemer. A baby born in Bethlehem who's called the Redeemer, who restores Israel, okay, and who's famous. Gee, I wonder who that could be. What baby was born in Bethlehem who's famous and who's the Redeemer? Again, we have one mistake in our Bible. It's the blank page. We can distinguish between the covenants, but not the books of the covenant. That's an artificial barrier that people put there. Let's continue. My apologies to those who know this. When we read the Old Testament genealogies of Genesis, Chronicles, and Ezra, we see there is a deviation within those records. We also see a deviation between the genealogy of Luke and the genealogy of Jesus according to Matthew, don't we? Now, let's understand the reasons. The Jews made a distinction between recorded pedigree and genealogy. One had to do with law, the other had to do with law in light of theology. Let me explain. In Jewish genealogies, you only include the ancestors who are relevant to the theological point you are trying to make. Matthew breaks up the genealogy of Jesus into three sets of 14 generations. That trisect Israel's history. From Abraham to David. From David to the loss of the throne of David, that is the Babylonian captivity. And from then, the Babylonian captivity to the coming of the Messiah. He trisects it. Okay. The three sets of 14. He only includes the ancestors important to the theological point he's trying to make.
in gematria, Hebrew alphanumerics. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, David, David, four, plus six, plus four, equals 14. It is mathematically structured gematrially. You have both Greek and Hebrew gematria. The Greek uses a different word for it. 14. He only includes the ancestors that are important to the case he's trying to make theologically that Jesus is the rightful descendant of David. Now understand this. The line of David was vital. Let's look at the messianic prophecy of Isaiah chapter 11. Verse 10, it will come about on that day that the nations will resort to the Shoresh Ishai, the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the people, and his resting place will be glorious, or as an ensign for the people. In other words, the Gentile nations would come because of the root of Jesse, the Messiah. The rabbis recognized that's about the Messiah. He'd make the Gentile nations believe. Hence, the root of Jesse, the house of David, the royal line of the tribe of Judah, okay, had to begin with a marital union of a Jew and a Gentile. Boaz had to marry Ruth to begin the line of David. Jesus had to come from a union of Jew and non-Jew because although he is king of the Jews and a Jewish Messiah and a Jew, he is the savior of both Jew and Gentile. Hence, the royal line of David would come from the union of Jew and Gentile. There are specifically two Gentile women included in his ancestry genealogically. By including Ruth, a Moabitess, a Moabitess was to the Jews like what a German would be to the Jews in the 21st century. They mistreated them and they'd be the, of all the Gentiles, they would be the ones that Jews had reason to dislike the most. The other, of course, Rahab had been a prostitute. Who's going to boast about having an ancestress who was a prostitute? <laughs> Son of man came to save sinners. Okay. Now, you have another problem. In the genealogy of Matthew, you have Jeconiah. But because of his sin, there was a curse on Jeconiah that one of his heirs would not be king. And Jesus was a descendant of Jeconiah, according to Matthew. Therefore, we have a problem. These things account for the distinction and the variation between Luke's genealogy and Matthew's. Pay attention. 
first one. The Matthean genealogy that goes through Matthew. is Judaic. It's concerned about the Jewish Jesus as the descendant of David. It is interesting to note that in the earliest recorded rabbinic opposition to the messiahship of Jesus, he was never attacked on the basis of ancestry. The second temple records were destroyed. Nonetheless, if they had any genealogical record, any pedigree record to use against him. They would have done it. He was never, ever attacked as not being the Messiah on the basis of not having the correct ancestry. Luke, however, is universal. It goes not to Abraham, who is the first Jew, as Matthew does. It goes to Adam. It is showing Jesus as the Savior of both. Okay. Second, Luke's genealogy is different than Matthew's in that you have Jeconiah. But in Luke, No, Jeconiah. Third. Matthew's genealogy is the royal line, and it is paternal through Joseph. Mary's genealogy is the one in Luke. It is Levitical and maternal. How do we know this? Let us look at the genealogy in Luke. Luke chapter 3, verse 23. And when he began his ministry, Yeshua himself was about 30 years of age, same age that David began as king, being supposedly the son of Joseph. <laughs> the Talmud of all things, Sanhedrin 25c or Gimel, the Talmud of all things, says Miriam but Heli. The rabbis of the day knew that Luke's genealogy was Mary's. That it was Mary who was the daughter, that's Bat in Hebrew, of Eli, Heli being a Greekization of Eli. Why is this? It solves the problem of Jeconiah because he is biologically born from Mary, not from Joseph. There could not be a descendant of Jeconiah. Secondly, a king had to be from the tribe of Judah. High priest had to be from the tribe of Levi. When one king burned incense in the temple, God smote him with leprosy, didn't he? Now, this is important. In the Hasmonean period, John Hadakonis, a high priest, made himself king. That was wrong. And it was the beginning of the downfall of the Hasmoneans, morally and spiritually. Nonetheless, king had to be from the tribe of Judah, high priest from the tribe of Levi. 
When Jesus took our sin on the cross, he was our high priest making atonement on the altar, wasn't he? We're told in Hebrews he was our high priest. Okay. From a different order, the order of Melchizedek, nonetheless, he was our high priest. But Pilate puts up the sign, King of the Jews. Only the Messiah could be both king and priest. You understand? Only the Messiah could be king and priest, and only the Messiah had to be king and high priest. Mary came from a Levitical family background. Elisheva, Elizabeth, was her relative. They were obviously Levites. Zachariah was a high priest. John the Baptist came from a Levitical family. He was a potential high priest himself, but he turned his back on the temple establishment due to its corruption and God's calling on his life. How could Jesus and John be cousins? Jesus had a Levitical bloodline, you understand? Through his mother, he had a Levitical bloodline that also solved the problem of Jeconiah. Does everybody understand? Turn with me, please, to Genesis chapter 49. Jacob's prophecy. Verse 10 of the tribe of Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. To him shall be the obedience of the peoples of the nations. The rabbis recognized that Shiloh here, which had been the capital of Israel and the dwelling place of the ark for two centuries, is a metaphor for the Messiah. It has the root with the one who was sent, Shiloach, the Hebrew word for apostle. Remember in Hebrews chapter 4, Jesus with the definite article is ho apostolo, the apostle. All apostolic authority comes from him. You have to get into the uh, relationship between Greek and Hebrew. Okay. Until Shiloh comes, till he comes, the scepter would not depart from Judah. Once Herod the Great died, the Romans relocated their capital from Jerusalem to Caesarea Capitolina on the coast, the Caesarea Maritina, where Paul was imprisoned. That's where Pilate's headquarters was. That was the Roman capital. At one point, it was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. After Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch, it was the biggest. Sizable Jewish community, but a sizable Greco-Roman community. Big city, far bigger than Jerusalem. Pilate had to come to Jerusalem and stay at Fortress Antonio. But he lived in Caesarea Maritina. They have the stone where he lived was discovered by archaeologists. It's in the museum in Jerusalem, but a facsimile is still where they discovered it in Caesarea. I've seen it many times. The scepter departed from Judah. The Messiah had to come before this would happen. <laughs> you understand? The prophecy was literally fulfilled. Okay. Now, we have another factor. Most Jewish genealogies are patrilinear, but we do have one in the Old Testament that is matrilinear. You know the story of the daughters of Zalofahad. Remember the seven, and they had no man? You have matrilinear genealogies. They are very, that story is very important to understand the genealogy of Jesus. It's not just an Old Testament curiosity. It's there for a reason. It sets the precedent of matrilinear genealogy. Ruth had a Leverite marriage. 
What is Leverite marriage? When someone died without leaving someone to take care of the widow and to perpetuate the Yerusha, the family inheritance. This was important. The land was God's. He apportioned it to tribe and family in the book of Joshua and so forth. You could not lose your family ancestral land through debt. You could lose it temporarily, and agricultural produce could be reaped from it to the person who held the debt until the year of Jubilee. At the year of Jubilee, it had to be repatriated. This idea of Yerusha was important. It was especially important in the tribes of Levi and the tribes of Judah because the identity of the Davidic king and the identity of the high priest depended on it. So if your brother died, you would be expected to procreate a son on behalf of your deceased brother, who legally would be the son of your brother. <laughs> legally, he would be the son of your brother in the pedigree tables for all purposes of Yerusha. The only form of birth control they, of course, had in the ancient world was coitus interruptus. It is only forbidden in one case, in the case of Leverite marriage. You were not allowed to practice birth control with your brother's widow. Again, the honorarium, honor thy father and mother. There had, that was, there had to be a son to take care of the widow in her old age. You were not to use your brother's widow as a sex object. God allowed for that Better right marriage to take place in order to perpetuate the Yerusha and to be sure the widow would be taken care of in her old age. There would be children to take care of her. That was their pension. Okay. That was the only time that birth control was disallowed. There are people, and I don't know, there's a Christian organization in America that publishes a ridiculous magazine. He's an Australian guy, but it's a ridiculous magazine called Rubies from Above, and he's on a crusade against married couples practicing birth control, and this becomes one of his proof texts. <laughs> he doesn't even know what he's talking about. I tried to tell him once, but he, he built his little empire, and his magazine circulation depended on propagating the myths. <laughs> he's, he's got his little magazine. Anyway, uh, and the guy damaged people. Um, there was a young couple in New Zealand, and, and the wife suffered multiple, they had about six or seven kids, and the wife had multiple miscarriages, um, obstetric problems, and she was told medically that if she became pregnant again and miscarried again, there would be a danger of antenatal hemorrhage, and she could die and leave these other kids without a mother. And these ridiculous people told her not to have fallopian tubes tied, or <laughs> her husband not to have a, a, a vasectomy. He, he, he said, just trust God by faith and get pregnant again anyway. <laughs> this is how screwed up these people are. They're absolutely ridiculous, non because they misinterpret one verse. Absolute ignorance. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. That poor family, they were so messed up by what this, these ridiculous people did to them. And they think that's their ministry. This was Leverite marriage, okay? Although conceived of the Holy Spirit and pre-existent, Jesus is the biological son of Mary. Joseph is his foster father. This genealogy is the Leverite one. Okay. So you've got the Leverite in Matthew, the biological in Luke, the royal paternal in Matthew, the Levitical maternal in Luke. You've got the Jack, Jeconiah factor in Matthew. You don't have it in Luke. You have a Judeocentric genealogy in Matthew, a universal one in Luke. Okay? This is the legal line. 
This is the legal line. This is the pedigree. This is the pedigree. Matthew, legal. Luke, pedigree. Everyone understand the basis, Ruth chapter 4, for those reasons. He'd be savior of Jew and Gentile, hence the house of David had to be a union of the two. Remember, Abraham was a Gentile who God converted to Old Testament Judaism. Let's go back to Gabriel. Once more, when we look at the last prophecy and the last thing it says in the Old Testament, it's talking about the second coming, isn't it? The day of the Lord. Notice the Old Testament prophecies about the nativity are always in their broader context also about eschatology, his return. Turn with me, please, to Daniel chapter 9. Verse 21, please. While I was speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. Well, that's quite a thing. He comes to him at the time of the evening offering. Let's go to Daniel chapter 8, verse 16. The interpretation of the vineyard, of, of the vision of the little horn. I heard the voice of a man between the banks of the Ulai, and he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. That's quite a thing. Gabriel gives the understanding of the Antichrist, in part. Gabriel interprets Daniel chapter 9, which when we work it out and we have a teaching called the year of Jubilee, Ashana Yovel, we explain the Messiah would have to come and die before the second temple would be destroyed, and it works out to circa 32 A.D., the time of the decrees and so forth. So Daniel predicts things that he is given explanation of by Gabriel. Gabriel explains both the first coming of the Messiah and the second centuries apart, 500 years apart. But Gabriel gives the understanding of the first coming of Jesus, and Gabriel gives the understanding of the second coming of Jesus. Same angel, same function. Let's continue. As we looked at, there is the Elijah factor. Elijah must come again. Remember, Elijah, Elisha, and John the Baptist all have the same spirit. We deal with this in our books, Harpezo. But remember also the following. Pay attention. The transitional figure. The transitional figure. 
Samuel was also conceived supernaturally, wasn't he? Samuel was the last figure of the period of judges. Hatekofat Hashoftim. He was the last of the judges. But he was the first of the prophets. You understand? He was the last of the judges, but the first of the prophets in the periods of prophets and kings. That transitional figure, supernaturally conceived, you see the same pattern. Let's look now. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew. In Matthew 16, Elijah comes and is transfigured. This is the second time, in some sense, an Elijah figure comes. John the Baptist comes with the spirit of Elijah, but now Elijah himself comes. Okay. But Jesus makes it clear. He says something about John that people found it very difficult to understand. Jesus says, Elijah is coming. But I tell you, he's already come. What is he talking about? If you can receive it, Elijah came in the form of the spirit of Elijah being put on John. Jesus says that. But Jesus makes it clear that Elijah is still to come again. The Elijah factor is vital to the first coming of Jesus. But it is even more vital to the second coming of Jesus. It's even more vital to his return. Let's go further. Turn with me, please, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 8. You have a typology in verse 6. Inasmuch as these people have rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloach, the pool of Siloam. Remember Jesus said, I'll give you living water? In the Simcha Bet the Shoeva ritual of John chapter 7. This is the prophecy as well as Jeremiah chapter 2. They reject the living water. Shaloam, Shaloach. There'd be a rejection of the Messiah. Now, verse 12. You are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all this people call a conspiracy. You are not to fear what they dread or be in dread of it. With the first coming of Jesus, there was an avalanche of conspiracy theories masquerading as prophecy. It was diverting the people away from what the scriptures said into speculation. They were being afraid of this conspiracy and afraid of that one, and it was taking their focus off the scriptures. In the secular world, there are conspiracy theorists. There are journals in the American Journal of Psychiatric Medicine about people who have become clinically delusional, believing in conspiracy theories, paranoid to the point where if people disagreed with them, to them that was some evidence or proof that they were part of the conspiracy. It happens in the secular world. This gets into the church and becomes something confused with end time prophecy. It's fine to be aware of things like 
the dangers of Freemasonry. No Christian should be involved in Freemasonry. Burn the aprons and quit. We know from the testimonies of people who were in the higher degrees of Freemasonry who got saved that it is theosophically Luciferian. I agree no Christian should be in it. But people become obsessed with the Illuminati and obsessed with Freemasonry and they get into these conspiracy theories and they get obsessed with it and they confuse it with discernment and prophecy. It takes their focus away from what the Word of God says and puts it on these speculations, conjectures. That was a big problem when he came the first time. And it's a problem, quite a problem, now that he's coming again. We are warned, do not say it's a conspiracy to all they say is a conspiracy. Have you heard that Bill Clinton and Barack Obama are in a Masonic Lodge? Do you, you hear? I know people go on about this. You can go on to this whole blog sites and websites of people claiming to be Christians, concerned with prophecy and discernment, who are absorbed, even consumed with it. Second thing that happens, verse 19. When they say to you, Consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter. There was an explosion of the occult before he came the first time. And there will be an explosion of the occult when he comes again. This will include many false messiahs, false Christ, false prophets. We read about the account in Acts chapter 5. Rabbi Gamaliel reports of someone called Judah of Galilee. Well, he's only one of many that we know of. If you were to read Josephus or the Mishnah, there were tons of these people. Another we know of is Simon Magnus. But even before the birth of Jesus, there was a messianic expectation, a misguided one, with many false messiahs. Many false messiahs. These three things happen again. Now when we continue reading, remember there's no chapter divisions in the Hebrew canon, we get to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. A child will be born to us, a son will be given, the government will be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Peli, Yoetz, Wonderful Counselor, El Gabor, God Almighty, Aviad, Eternal Father, and Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace. And the government will be upon his shoulder, the increase of his government or of his peace, and the throne of David over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Notice Zechariah, like Malachi, like Micah, is prophesying for both the first coming and the second coming in the same context. The first coming teaches about the second. The caveats. Occult. Conspiracy theories and theorists. False Christs. This applies to believers. All three of these things 
I have been warning for years, and I've been warning as someone who is personally a charismatic. By both theology and experience, I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I don't like to call myself a charismatic, but I certainly do not believe the gifts of the Spirit ended with the apostles. So much of what is going on today in the name of charismata is neo-Montanism, is charismania, is a cult. So much of what is called prophecy, the Cindy Jacobs type people, that is clairvoyance. The Rick Joyner's false prophecies, that is clairvoyance. What happens in that, that, that Johnson's church in California, the, the, the feathers from the angels' wings and the... This is a cult. Conspiracy theories. Again, there are blog sites and websites devoted to it, being run by people who are professing evangelicals. False Christs. Oh, my Lord. Liberty University. What do you do when Jerry Falwell brings out Sun Young Moon, who claims to be the Lord of the Second Advent, who says that Jesus failed in his mission, he came to succeed where Jesus failed, he's the Lord of the Second Advent, and his wife is the Holy Spirit. He gives Liberty University $2.3 million, Jerry Forwell embraces him and proclaims him to be an unsung hero, and Ed Hinson goes along with it. Says not a word. What do you do when Moon, Reverend Moon, his divine principal, is convicted, sent to federal prison, and Tim LaHaye tries to organize 300 major evangelical leaders to volunteer to go to federal prison in solidarity with the self-proclaimed antichrist? I wish I was making this stuff up. I wish I was making it up. All three of those things are realities. They were painful, dangerous, tragic realities in his first coming, and they are no less painful, threatening tragedies in his second. And there's more to come. Let us continue. Pompey, the Roman general, made a covenant with the Jews, guaranteeing them protection from Parthia, that is Persia. Once he makes the covenant, he betrays the Jews. Instead of being a protectorate, they find themselves a de facto colony. But he enters the Holy of Holies. When anyone other than the high priest on the Day of Atonement enters the Holy of Holies, it is a picture of the Antichrist. You understand? The abomination of desolations. That happened in the first coming. That will happen in the second. The role of Rome. That guy, Ingel, whatever his name was, knelt down and kissed the feet of the Pope's representative. Literally, prostrated, belt, knelt down home and kissed his, the feet of the Pope's representative. New Apostolic Reformation. What's Ingel's first name? Lou. 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 I saw the picture of it on the internet. It is unbelievable. The Vatican has a strong interest. You can see the, the, the pontifical mission inside Jaffa Gate to the left. Big Vatican flags flying over it. The factor of Rome and false peace. That took place at his first coming, takes place at his second. 
We've explained before about Caesar Augustus. Other emperors had been deified by the Roman Senate posthumously. Caesar Augustus was the emperor when Jesus was born. And he was the first emperor to be deified in his lifetime. Formerly, he was the Roman general Octavius, made famous by the Battle of uh, Octavius. It was in Cyprus. It was the Battle in Cyprus. Octavius becomes Caesar. Uh, Atrium, Battle of Atrium. He's deified. But to maintain economic and financial control of most of the known world, which was the Roman Empire, he takes a census. He does it twice, assigning everyone a number in order to maintain complete financial control of the world. You can go to the ruins of Ephesus in modern Turkey to this day. There is a promenade leading to the Agora, the market. The gate over the promenade excavated a sign. Caesar Vios Zeus. Theos, Caesar, son of God. You could not buy or sell unless you called Caesar the son of God. The believers would not do it. They were used as street lamps set alight on poles on either side of the promenade leading into the Agora to illuminate the market at night, 24-hour trading long before 7-Eleven in Walmart. Christians will provide the light. You could not buy or sell without acknowledging the deity of the emperor. This emperor worship and the assigning of numbers happens again in his second coming, doesn't it? Revelation chapter 13. It's going to be a replay of what happened then. Let's continue. The Herod factor. We've explained this before. Herod comes, tries to preempt the birth of the Messiah. The Romans proclaimed Herod, the great, to be king of the Jews. They proclaimed him as king of the Jews. When the Magi come, and say, where is he? He's been born king of the Jews. This imposter wants to keep power. This is a picture of Daniel chapter 8. The Antichrist will want to keep power because it will be given to the saints of the Most High when the Lord comes. The Romans also used Herod to organize the Olympics. <laughs> The Romans had great ways to divert people. One was pluralism, their version of multiculturalism. Now understand it's the same today. When you see people who are progressivists, who are pro-abortion, pro-homosexual, and the rest of it, and don't like Christians, when they speak of pluralism and diversity, they don't mean people with diverse ideas. <laughs> they don't mean people with diverse beliefs. They mean people who agree with them but who look different. <laughs> they may be a different, they may have different sex or a different ethnicity or a different race or skin color or something. When they say diversity, they don't mean diversity. They just mean people who look different than them but think the way they do. That's the way the Romans were. They were into that kind of diversity. You had to subscribe to the party line in religion 
and culture, then you can do what you want, then you can be diverse. <laughs> but it was not real diversity. The Romans achieved this artificial unity by different means, one of which, again, was religio licita, religio illicita, as I've explained. The emperor was the pontiff, the head of the pantheon of all religions, the bridge builder between the fates, pontificus maximus. But the other, this was a big deal, something they borrowed from the Greeks, sports. They did everything they could to get people sports mad, sports crazy. Get people consumed with sports as entertainment so they won't think about their problems politically, economically, socially, morally. Everything became focused on trying to keep everybody placated by diversion. That was the mentality of Rome. There's nothing new under the sun. Now, I like a ball game. I like a boxing match. I like a lot of sports. But when you see sport becoming religion, in England they sing, they don't go to church on Sunday, they'll go to a soccer game and they'll actually sing a hymn and abide with me. They'll sing a hymn in the stadium before the soccer game instead of going to church. That, that's not, it's unbelievable. You go to certain countries like Italy, sports has replaced religion. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Australia, that country is completely sports mad. You put on the news, there's 10 minutes of news and 40 minutes of sports. Now this is not, I'm, I'm not against sports, I, I like sports. But sports were used for purposes other than athletics and entertainment. They were used as a control mechanism of the culture. Herod was in charge of it. Turn with me to Revelation 12. We've explained this. Another sign appeared in Revelation 12, 3. In heaven, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. Now that is straight from the book of Daniel, isn't it? His tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour the child. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Her child was raptured, harpezod. The woman fled to the wilderness, where place had been prepared <coughs> 1,260 days, <coughs> half of seven lunar years. At the end, verse 17, the dragon was enraged with the woman, went off to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Let's get this. This is a Pesher interpretation of the nativity narrative. The nativity with Herod is the Peshet, the simple meaning. The recapitulation of it is the Pesher. As Herod tried to preempt the birth, the coming of the Messiah, the Messiah, by divine intervention, was snatched away raptured. Then he goes and kills the other babies. Antichrist, in the character of Herod, will attempt to do the same thing. Daniel 8, 21. The rapture will foil his plan, but then he turns against the woman and the rest of her offspring. He goes after Israel and the Jews. And anybody who tries to profess Christ who's left. It's going to happen again. Now notice, the Sanhedrin had a head knowledge, as we'll see. They knew where the Messiah would be born. 
all Jerusalem was troubled with him. They are not going to want Jesus to come back, as we'll look at on Saturday. This is the Herod factor. Remember, Herod was ethnically an Idumean, an Arab. His parents were Edomites who were converted to Judaism in the Hasmonean period and relocated to the Negev. He was an ethnic Arab. But as a religion of political convenience, he was a Jew. However, to the Romans, he was a Roman. He was culturally and politically Roman. The Europeans considered him to be European. The Arabs considered him to be Arab. The Jews considered him to be a Jew. He knew how to be all things to all people, to con them all. This teaches something powerful about the Antichrist to come. You understand? He's going to be able to con everybody because he's going to make them all think he is their man in the character of Herod. Emperor worship, mumbling of the people. The Herod factor. Notice the seven heads and ten horns from Daniel. That is in Revelation chapter 13. Is associated with Herod. In the Pesher of the Nativity narrative in Revelation 12. Again, I point you to our book, Shadows of the Beast. But Herod did something else. He took Ezekiel's vision of the millennial temple, combined it with Greco-Roman architecture, and he rebuilt the second temple as if it was the third one, putting his own signature and emblem on it, but putting Fortress Antonio to the north of it, overshadowing it. That teaches something about what the Antichrist is going to do on the Temple Mount. Let's go just a little bit longer. What did Jesus say was going to happen in Matthew 24 as the final event at his coming? Turn with me to the Olivet Discourse. Let's look at Matthew 24. Verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. The tribes of the earth will mourn. <laughs> when the sign appeared, Herod mourned and all Jerusalem with him, didn't they? The Magi knew it. Understand the Magi. Parthenia was Persia. They confronted the Romans successfully for 300 years. They couldn't conquer Rome, but they stopped Rome. The Celts, the Scottish, and the Welsh stopped Rome in the west. The Romans built a wall eventually, Hadrian's Wall across the north of England to stop the Scots. They didn't want to mess with the Irish. They thought the Irish were crazy. They called it Hibernia. They said all of their wars are happy and their songs are sad. Things haven't changed much. The Romans didn't make a distinction between Cornish and Welsh and Scottish and Irish. They were all Celts to them. The Romans invaded 
Wales, but not successfully. They never conquered all of England. They never got Cornwall, and the southwest of England never messed with Ireland. Never, never Scotland. The Celts stopped the Romans in the west. The Persians stopped the Romans in the east, okay? But everything in the middle was Rome. Big chunk of turf. Daniel 10 tells us Persia is going to emerge strong at the end of the age and be a threat to Israel. The reason Israel made the covenant with Pompey, with the Romans, was because of the Persian threat. The Persians had been beneficial to the Jews, going back to Cyrus the Great, but then became a threat. The same thing happens in the last days. Up until the Shah, when the peacock throne fell in the 1970s, the Persians had been beneficial to the Jews, but then it changed. You understand? The same thing happens again. The Iran factor. Now, Iran comes from the word Aryan. Persians are not Middle Eastern people. They are Europeans. They are anthropological cousins of the Germans who live in the Middle East. Iranians are not Middle Easterners except by geography. Anthropologically, they are Europeans. Their language is not a Semitic language like Hebrew and Arabic. The Persia factor, that is Iran. The whole strategic scenario that Rome and everyone was concerned with when Jesus was born was Parthenia, was Iran. That's the way it was in his first coming. That's the way it is in his second. They turned and looked to the West to protect them from Iran. <laughs> Happens again. It gets sold a bill of goods. Now, let's understand this. The Magi were Medes. The Medes are the anthropological ancestors of the modern Kurds. The Kurds have a terrible history of persecution by the Turks by the Arabs and by the Persians, especially by the Turks. They're more open to the gospel than other Muslims because they've gotten such a rotten deal from other Muslims for centuries. They're also the least anti-Semitic. There are actually Kurdish Jews. Most of them live in Israel now. The Medes had been aligned with Persia. Media Persia. Darius the Mede was favorable to the Jews. We read this in Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, the relationship between the Medes and the Jews. Okay. Well, let's look further now. We know from the book of Esther and from the book of Daniel that these people in Iran and even some people in Babylon, prior to the Persian Empire, monotheized and began to believe in the God of the Jews because of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and then of Esther and Mordechai. They would have learned the Hebrew scriptures. Although it has been mutated over the centuries, now they're into fire veneration, the beliefs of the original Zoroastrians, the followers of Zarathustra, were in many respects close to what Christians and Jews believe. In fact, there's a parody with the Sons of Light, Sons of Darkness motif found in the Qumran literature that's found in the ancient writings of the Zoroastrians. It was monotheistic and believed in personal moral responsibility, etc. These people had been strongly influenced by the Jews who lived there, and their monarchs, their kings, came under the influence of the Hebrew scriptures because of Esther, Mordechai, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They followed a star 
idiotically, some people have tried to say they were practicing astrology. This is pure nonsense. They were taught the Hebrew scriptures, we are told by Daniel, by Mordechai. Read Numbers, please, in conclusion, chapter 24. Verse 17. The ancient rabbis said this is about the Messiah. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob, and a scepter shall arise from Israel, and shall crush through the forehead of Moab, and tear down the sons of Sheth. It goes on now about what's going to happen. Verse 19, one from Jacob shall have dominion, etc. That speaks of his second coming. They knew the star was going to come from Jacob for the arrival of the Messiah, a sign in heaven. So they followed it. It's no mystery as to what it was. It was the prophecy, the messianic prophecy of Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. Israel, tragically, having rejected their Messiah, falsely attributed this prophecy to Simon Bar Kokhba in the second century. Bar Kokhba in Aramaic means son of a star. He's also mockingly called Bar Kizva, son of a lie. Having rejected the true Messiah, they misapplied this under Rabbi Akiva to Bar Kokhba, a type, another type of the Antichrist. These were the Magi. They knew from the sign. Notice those who knew, who were ready, wanted Jesus to come. And they were non-Jews. But Herod, when he heard that sign was there, <laughs> all Jerusalem was troubled with him. Herod did not want Jesus to come. It says when the tribes see that sign, they are going to freak out, mourn. The sign of the coming of the Son of Man. In his first coming, there was the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. In the second coming, there will be that sign. His first coming teaches about his second. We cannot approach the subject of his second coming until we do so from the paradigm of his first coming. His first coming is the template for his second. Only when we correctly understand and interpret the nativity, historically and theologically, can we approach the subject of his second coming. If you want to know about his second coming, the first thing we have to do is correctly understand his first. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jacob Prash. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. 
obviously practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo. What the scripture actually teaches about the rapture. The snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo. All available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.